All righty. Well, good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Conlon Wasick. I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Lake County and president of Grace Lake District 127 Board of Education. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to join our forum on emerging trends and preventable death during, during COVID. For those not familiar with the League, we are a nonpartisan organization dedicated to encouraging informed and active participation in government. We strive to empower all voters by working to increase understanding around major public policy debates through education and advocacy. That's why the League of Women Voters of Lake County and Illinois has been working since 2012 to help establish and sustain the system whose data you will see this afternoon. We have an excellent presentation for you. Dr. Marian Mason, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine with Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, joins us to present what the emerging data is telling us about preventable COVID-related deaths in Lake County. While this topic is challenging, hope lies in how we learn from our experiences and how we decide to move our community forward. After Marianne's presentation, each of our panelists will have an opportunity to speak about what their organization has been experiencing and the problem they foresee as Lake County moves into the fall and winter months. Our moderator for today's event is Lake County Chair Sandy Hart. Sandy is not only steering the county through these challenging times, she is an inspiring advocate for our most vulnerable citizens, many of whom suffer from the kinds of mental health issues that all too often end in tragedy. Prior to introducing our esteemed panelists, Sandy will briefly bring us up to date on the county's response to COVID. As Mary Ann, Sandy, and our panelists speak, we invite you to ask questions. Use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to send questions to Nia Andrews. Once all of our panelists have spoken, Nia will facilitate the question and answer portion of today's forum, and she may be joined by Sandy at that time too. This event is being recorded and a copy of it will be made available through the League of Women Voters website. With that, I will hand you over to the Honorable Sandy Hart. Sandy. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's very kind. And I so appreciate uh, League of Women Voters Lake County for putting together this forum. Um, there are so many um, important issues that are before Lake County, and I always feel like the League of Women Voters does a great job educating people and finding great experts like, uh, like the folks on the panel today to really inform our residents. So I'm not going to talk too much about what we're doing in Lake County, um, aside to say that um, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing, both with my colleagues on the county board, as well as my colleagues here today and others, and also our tremendous staff, who I don't think anybody's taken a vacation since March, uh, working weekends and nights, just ensuring that people are getting the help that they need. Um, so I'm very proud of, of our staff and our team, and of course, of the work our first responders are doing to care for people who have been devastated by COVID-19. Um, really what we're doing is helping people recover uh, from this pandemic, even as it's ongoing. So we, are pri we have prioritized the federal funding that we received through the CARES Act, $121.5 million. Uh, first, by helping people with food and shelter and utilities, and then helping our small businesses as they are starting to reopen and helping our municipalities to cover their expenses. Um, but really most importantly, I think everybody's here uh, to learn from our experts about the things that they are seeing. So I am going to, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Marian Mason. Marian Mason is, uh, Dr. Marian Mason, excuse me, is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. She also serves as Director of Violence and Injury Research at Northwestern's Bueller Center for Health Policy and Economics. And she is the Principal Investigator of the Illinois Violent Death Reporting System and the Statewide Drug Overdose Reporting System. Dr. Mason received a doctorate in sociology from, from Loyola University of Chicago, where she focused on community development and public housing policy. Her current research includes, uh, excuse me, her current research interests are in promotion of community well-being through the reduction of preventable deaths, including overdose, 
suicide, and homicide. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Mason. Thank you, Chairman Hart. And um, uh, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event and giving us an opportunity to present these data and to highlight the wonderful work um, the panelists are doing in Lake County around uh, preventable deaths. So um, without further ado, I'll get into the presentation. Um, and let's see. I'm still playing with the uh, how the slides work, so bear with me. <laughs> okay. So I have uh, three goals for today. And they are, um, I want to help you understand the scope of opioid overdose, suicide, and homicide deaths in Lake County. Um, because when we understand the scope of these problems, then uh, that's the first step to solving them. I, I want to help you learn where these deaths are occurring in Lake County. And um, I want to have a dialogue with you about um, how these deaths are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, I think the first question for many people in this meeting today is what are preventable deaths, right? Um, so those are deaths that um, could have been avoided had public health interventions um, been available, um, and especially public health interventions that focus on uh, social determinants of health. So uh, these are things like lifestyle and behavioral factors like smoking or diet or substance use. They're uh, also socioeconomic status, things like employment and education. And uh, they're also bigger than that. They're environmental factors like pollution and having abandoned buildings in your community. So those are the types of interventions that could play a very big role in preventing the kind of deaths I'm going to talk about today. So for today, our focus is on unintentional opioid overdose, suicide by all means, uh, not just overdose, and then homicide. So I, I want to tell you about our data sources. Um, the data source for the unintentional opioid involved overdose deaths is uh, the statewide unintentional drug overdose reporting system or SUDORS. Um, that's a CDC funded project um, in which uh, 32 states participate and we collect data from death certificates, coroner or medical examiner reports, toxicology reports and autopsy reports. They're the most comprehensive data on uh, drug overdose available uh, in the United States, and we're proud to be a state that participates in this. Um, and then the data source for suicide and homicide deaths is the Illinois Violent Death Reporting System, and that also is operated by the CDC and is a national system. All 50 states, uh, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico participate. And like SUDORS, uh, IVDRS collects data from death certificates, coroner medical examiner reports, law enforcement reports, toxicology, and autopsy reports. So these two systems really, uh, they're comprehensive and they help us understand the who, what, where, and how of these sorts of deaths. And understanding that is the first step toward prevention. So uh, I want to give us a second. Dr. Mason, May, I'm seeing some people who are not seeing the slides moving forward. So I just wanted to double check and make sure that the slides are moving. So what slide would, would should we be on? Uh, we should be on slide six. Okay. I don't believe we're on slide six. I'm not sure who is uh, moving the slides ahead. Oh, I, I'm uh, sharing my slides and I am moving them. So let me um, try this again. Okay. For bringing that to my attention. That's okay. So um, I heard from uh, Amy and a couple others, but it shows that we're on the first slide and that's what I see as well. Okay. Now I see Lake County IVDRS and SUDORS. Right. 
Okay. okay. Slide well, six. Fortunately, um, most of the things I said uh, related to the content of the slide, so no one's missed anything. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I want to say a word about Lake County Ivy DRS and Sudors um, because we have a strong partnership. Lake County joined Ivy DRS in 2011 and Sudors in 2016 when it began. So Lake County's been with us since the beginning of Sudors and been a very strong partner. Uh, I want to thank the uh, the coroner's office and the uh, county sheriff for strong partnerships uh, and really made this presentation and the, uh, these data possible for us to talk about today. So a big thanks. Um, I also want you to keep in mind uh, and why I'm doing this. Um, and that is, uh, we believe data can help. It can help you identify who's at risk in your community and knowing who's at risk is a key part of uh, creating positive interventions. It can help us gain some insight into where the opportunities for prevention and intervention may, may be. And it can also be helpful in decision-making uh, regarding resource allocation. So uh, I put that little cartoon up in the, um, the upper right because the way I think about it is uh, trying to work on these problems without data is like being in a canoe without an oar. So the data help us find, uh, find a way to get where we're going and to have a, have a plan about where we're going. It's my hope today that the data I share with you uh, will, will uh, be helpful in thinking about where the county is going on this. Um, so I'm going to start off with the unintentional opioid overdose uh, deaths in Lake County. Our data from 2018, which is the most recently available data through the SUDOR system. Here is a simple chart that really looks at who's, who's impacted. And so um, you may or may not know this, or it may, may or may not be reflected in your experience, but the most at risk groups uh, in Lake County for opioid overdose are white males between the ages of uh, 25 and 34. That's the highest risk group in Lake County. So I think one thing that data can help us with is um, really ground our perceptions of the problem in reality. So these data are helpful for that. And we also uh, see that fentanyl is uh, by far the most frequently found substance in these overdoses. And I will say Lake County is a little different from other places in Illinois in terms of fentanyl involvement. Um, it actually is a little uh, lower than the rest of the state. I recently reviewed the state data and uh, it's at about 65% of all opioid overdose deaths in the state. And here it's a little different uh, in Lake County. Uh, so interesting to know, one of the things that data can uh, show us is how Lake County is unique or a little different from other places. Um, this is a heat map that shows you where geographically the overdose deaths are happening in Lake County. And um, I think you can read this intuitively. The red area would be the highest concentration of these deaths followed by the yellow, green, and blue, and then purple. So you see there's uh, several hot spots. Um, probably the epicenter is around Park City. Um, and that, but there, then there's some hot spots north near Benton and Beach Park and off to the west um, in Round Lake Beach and uh, Round Lake Park, uh, that kind of area. So that's where the hotspots are happening. And then if you look a little to the south, there's some issues in Vernon Hills and uh, Hawthorne Woods area. So the, again, these can be helpful for understanding where the problem is concentrated. Okay, um, now I wanna uh, provide similar information for suicides in Lake County. Um, and this is two years of data, 2017 and 18 combined. 
we combine the years of data because fortunately um, the, no, there aren't as many um, suicides and so we need to combine the years to have greater numbers to have better reliability. Okay, so here's a similar table, uh, the one I provided on overdose deaths. And uh, we see suicide risk uh, hits a different population. Um, still uh, a large proportion of white uh, and male, uh, but the age range is a little higher, it's 45 to 54. So that is the at most at risk group uh, for suicide in Lake County. Okay. And then uh, we look at a few things uh, specific to suicide and we see that hanging or strangulation is the, um, the leading manner or the manner with the highest proportion is uh, different than nationally where half or a little over half of suicides are by firearm. So Lake County is a little unique in that way. Um, and then we note that nearly half of uh, people who die by suicide have a diagnosed mental health problem at the time they um, die by suicide. So another circumstance to be aware of as we think about prevention and intervention. Okay. So here's our heat map. Um, and I think uh, what's interesting about this and thinking about it in comparison to the opioid overdose uh, map is that there's some similarities, uh, in particular the um, Park City area, um, the, the red part on the right, but also the, the Round Lake, Round Lake Beach area. Both of those are hot spots for opioid overdose, and both of those are hot spots for suicide in Lake County. But the other thing to notice about this is it's much more dispersed. It's less concentrated than opioid overdose. So there's a, um, a suicide presence uh, in different communities throughout Lake County, and uh, something to be aware of and think about as you move forward with prevention and intervention. Uh, so the last kind of category of preventable deaths I'll talk about today are homicides in Lake County. And again, uh, we have two years of data here uh, because thankfully homicides are not um, as prevalent as uh, overdose as well. Who's at risk uh, for homicide? Um, this is a different group altogether when you uh, look at the highest risk. So the highest risk group would be uh, black, male, between the ages of uh, 25 and 34. Um, so that's uh, interesting to note that of these three types of preventable deaths, uh, there's a very different population for homicide. Um, I'll just note too, we do a lot of work in Chicago, um, and uh, we see uh, a lot of homicides in the younger 18 to 24 year old group. So Lake County is different from your um, neighbor to the south in that homicides are concentrated among an older group. Uh, and then we see uh, almost three quarters of homicides are by firearm in Lake County. Um, again, you're different from your neighbor to the south where over 90% of their firearms in, in Chicago. So an interesting um, thing to note. Also, um, we track uh, some suspect information in the data set and um, typically it's informative to understand the relationship between the victim and the suspect. Um, and we see that 13% are intimate partners signaling a, a domestic violence issue. Um, also, that most of the relationships to uh, between this and the victim are unknown um, uh, is is something to consider. So here's our heat map again: uh, homicides, and homicide is concentrated in the same areas that are affected by overdose, um, suicide. 
um, but it's less dispersed. So it's mostly concentrated on the eastern uh, side uh, with Park City being the epicenter. So there's not as much a presence in the western or uh, to the south like there is in overdose and suicide. So again, something to consider the relationship between all three of these violent, um, these types of death and um, how they're uh, distributed in Lake County. So I hope you find that information uh, useful and something to think about as you move forward. Um, I did want to do some thinking with you about what these type of deaths look like during COVID, because um, COVID is a very different time uh, for all of us. We're all adjusting and learning and have new circumstances. So what we did uh, uh, is I uh, worked with our epidemiologist, Suzanne McClone, um, to track, to compare data to the same date in 2019. So we're making to 2020 comparisons. Um, I want you to know and understand that the data I'm presenting is probably going to undercount these deaths um, for a couple of reasons. One is that coroner's offices are overwhelmed. There's a lot more volume coming in, um, a lot more requests, uh, a lot more um, testing being done. So uh, there's been some delays in issuing death certificates. There's been delays in toxicology labs coming back. Um, and there's even been some short staffing as um, COVID affects uh, people who work in corner offices, whether they're out or quarantining or without childcare and whatnot. So uh, those are some of the reasons why these might be undercounts. So, uh, Please know the data are provisional. They're not certified yet. Um, we expect the undercount for overdoses to be exceptionally um, more significant because of the time it takes for toxicology testing to come back. And um, I also want to caution you to keep in mind that the impact of COVID is likely going to um, uh, occur over a long span. I think we're talking years. So, um, you know, thinking about this is the very shortest, most immediate uh, part of COVID, um, but also think going forward, there's likely to be impact for years. So we're just showing you a quick snapshot of the immediate. Okay. So looking at unintentional opioid involved overdose deaths, we see they're up very slightly. If you look at this graph, uh, the blue line is 2019, the red line is 2020. The big blue arrow uh, notes when the stay-at-home order took effect in Illinois. And uh, across the bottom are um, starting with week one of the year all the way to week 24. So this chart goes uh, through the end of the first week in June. So we can see that things are up just slightly, um, but you can see the general trend both in 2019 and 2020 has been uh, picking up uh, the springtime uh, has a pickup in overdose deaths. Um, I think uh, Coroner Cooper will have more information on this and can update this, but my best guess is that's an undercount. Okay. Uh, the same <clears throat> slide for suicides. Um, again, uh, I think this undercount, but what we've seen is a slightly fewer suicides during the initial months of COVID. Um, again, and this, these data end the first week in June. Okay. Then homicides. Uh, there's a bigger gap here. We see a, a pretty big decrease there. Um, 2020 is the red line. 2019 is the blue line. So um, about only one third of the 2019 homicides uh, had happened at week 24 or 23 in 2020. So um, I wanna think with you about where, we're, where we think this is going, where these tests are going during COVID. Um, I, we believe and are forecasting that opioid overdose deaths will go up substantially 
Um, and that's due to a lot of things, but some of the things we've heard and seen are a change in drug supply. So drugs move where people move, and when people can't move, uh, drugs can't move. And so the drug supply has changed. Um, and so uh, there, more be, there may be more lethal uh, mixtures out on the street. Um, there's social isolation with the stay at home order. There's more people who are home alone who are using alone. And so there's no one there to administer naloxone. Um, this was true early on in COVID, less so now, but there were fewer in-person services and outreach available. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the how they, they're filling that gap and what they're doing on that. Um, but there's also been usage disruption as people weren't able to get uh, the substances they regularly use, they, they go off them and then they decrease their tolerance. But when they start using again, they don't adjust for that. So that can result in opioids. And then there've been a, um, custody releases due to preventing people from getting COVID-19 in custody but release from custody is a risk factor for overdose. So we, we may be seeing more overdose related to that. Okay. So where do we think we're going with suicide? Um, this is a little bit more mixed and nuanced. We're really not sure. There's been a variety of things that have come with COVID that we know are suicide risks, uh, financial problems, addiction, um, anxiety, um, but we also know that there are some things that have come along with COVID that um, might be protective for suicide. Um, that there's uh, reinforced social support. Uh, some people are more in touch with others now. People have sort of banded together and feel like we're in this together. Uh, there has been a move toward telehealth, um, which can provide uh, needed services for some that maybe weren't available before COVID. Up some new resources for people. And then there's feelings of shared sacrifice that, um, you know, being in this together, that might help people feel like they belong to something. But a big risk factor here is that there have been a lot of more firearm purchases. And the number one risk factor for fire, uh, for suicide is having a firearm in the home. So it's a really mixed bag. We're not sure what's going to happen and we're watching this carefully. Okay. And then homicide. Um, I think what we see are uh, the potential for increases. So there's a lot of domestic pressures going on and when those pressures heat up, there uh, is more domestic violence and uh, domestic Homicides are one facet of that, so we might anticipate that going up. There are some community triggers that um, really signal the potential for increased community violence. Uh, a lot fewer resources, interventions more difficult, especially street outreach. They're not physically in school, which can create some issues, and just the financial struggles of our communities. Uh, and then, um, although there has been a reduction in mass shootings during the early stages of COVID, um, I think COVID combined with social unrest um, to the potential for more of these type of events. Um, you, you know, the social isolation for some people uh, combined with polarization of the country and more guns. Uh, we anticipate that, unfortunately, there might be an increase in those. So I um, wanted to sort of leave you with what we're thinking about academically on these issues and, and just uh, share that with you. Um, I want to, uh, before I leave today, just acknowledge uh, the Lake County League of Women Voters who organized this event. Um, uh, it's really special for us to be able to provide these data to a community. Uh, I want to thank the IVDRS and SUDORS team who collect these uh, data and analyze these data with the idea that we can prevent future deaths by doing this work. Um, we always recognize the victims and their family who we try to honor by doing this prevention work. 
Uh, these are just numbers to us. We really want to make a difference. And uh, thanks to an anonymous donor who uh, gave us the support to do these type of community, community events. So thanks all around. Um, if you should want data from IBDRS or SUDORS, I would point you to a, a tutorial and webinar we have available um, that can take you through the steps. Um, uh, you can go online to our website and do a data request there, or you can reach out to me and we can discuss your data needs. So uh, again, I'd like to thank everyone, and especially Mia Andrews, who's uh, running the communications for us. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Sandy. Okay, thank you so much. And I've been seeing the questions come through, so I am tracking them. And it's just a reminder for um, the people who are listening, you can send them to me or to Nia or write them to everybody and uh, I'm cutting and pasting them. So I do have them and keep the questions coming. Um, so first I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike Nierheim, our Lake County State's Attorney. And Mike will discuss how COVID-19 has increased drug overdoses, domestic abuse, and the effect on the many programs they lead and how they're responding to the community. So we'll take it away, uh, State's Attorney Nierheim. Well, thank you, Chair Hart, and uh, thank you to the League. Uh, I'll repeat all the thanks. I really appreciate you guys facilitating this discussion. Uh, Dr. Mason, thank you for your work and your presentation. Uh, I, I do especially appreciate at the end you recognizing the victims and the families. Um, and I think so often when we focus on data, this becomes a bunch of numbers and percentages, and it's, it is important to remember that these are people and their families that have been affected by this. Um, you know, certainly as, uh, as it relates to opioid overdoses, uh, domestic violence, child abuse, uh, the abuse of children, uh, in Lake County, we have absolutely seen an increase due to COVID. Uh, interestingly, what we're seeing here, and, and this data kind of bears out across the country, uh, there is a decrease in report, uh, reports of domestic violence to law enforcement, for example, uh, anywhere from 50 to 70% uh, throughout the country. Our numbers are down here in Lake County as well. However, uh, calls to hotlines, uh, whether it's for child abuse hotlines, either local or national, um, have skyrocketed. Uh, I was on a presentation yesterday where a safe place reported a 600% increase in uh, calls to their hotline, calls for service uh, throughout COVID. Um, you know, with regard to Text to Tip, which is an organization uh, or a program that we work with a lot through the opioid epidemic, uh, those texts are through the roof in terms of uh, young people reaching out and asking for help with uh, issues regarding suicidal ideation um, and all sorts of other issues that they're experiencing right now. So, um, and again, nationally, the child abuse hotlines uh, are experiencing huge increases in their volume. So what that's showing us is that the, these incidents are happening more, but they're being reported less. And I think uh, certainly less to the authorities. And certainly when it comes to domestic violence and crimes against children, the concern that we have is uh, most oftentimes uh, with COVID and with people being ordered to shelter in home, uh, we know that with these types of crimes, the abuser is in home with the victim. So what we're doing is we're isolating these people uh, in home with their abusers and as it relates to children uh, you know not only are they being isolated with uh, with the abuser but they're in a situation where it's very difficult for them to reach out and ask for help and make that report uh, we know with regard to the abuse of children for example that the vast majority of those cases occur where the abuser is somebody that is a family member uh, a friend of the family or somebody that has a pretty close relationship with the victim. And that, uh, that presents a challenge when, when these children are at home all the time. Uh, and then we also know that a lot of times these are reported uh, at school or when children are at sporting events or things like that where they can confide in a trusted adult or a teacher or a coach uh, who can then uh, bring the case to authorities. Well, of course, right now we know that most children are not in school. Uh, in their home, and the abuse continues, and there's, there's, and that's why, uh, tragically, these reports are down. Uh, what we expect to see is as kids go back to school, um, these reports are going to skyrocket. 
Uh, we have noticed some interesting uh, you know, new data coming into our Children's Advocacy Center, for example, where, uh, again, that organization has stayed open throughout, like many of the organizations represented on this call. Uh, but we've continued to help uh, those, those children when they've come through and they've reported. But we've seen uh, increases in reporting in certain areas. So, uh, for example, uh, with regard to teenagers who've been home with their parents more, uh, this situation has allowed them the opportunity to, to build relationships with family members um, to kind of specifically with their parents. And when, when the uh, abuser is somebody that is a family member but not in the household, we've seen increases in reports with those specific situations because now you have these uh, youth that are at home, they're spending more time with their parents, feeling more comfortable having those discussions uh, and are more uh, willing to come forward. We've also seen an increase with regard to teenagers, specifically high school students, that uh, again, being home more often, uh, building uh, stronger bonds with their family um, and not being in school because they've reported oftentimes that they're concerned about coming forward because they, face, they may face some ridicule in the school. Um, and not being in school and not having to face that has also helped increase uh, them coming forward. So um, we are seeing some interesting uh, uh, increase in reporting, but overall reporting's down and, and we know the abuse is continuing, which is obviously a significant concern. Uh, shifting over to overdose, uh, as has been said, our overdose deaths are up here in Lake County, uh, fentanyl, is certainly an issue, and I know Dr. Corner can, or Dr. Cooper can talk uh, a lot more about that, but uh, fentanyl we're seeing in more and more of our drug overdose deaths here in Lake County, uh, and that's been a steady increase since 2015 when it really first made its appearance here in Lake County. Uh, another situation with COVID that was a, a, a bad combination of people being isolated at home, struggling with addiction, uh, needing help, um, and, and then you combine that with a lack of resources, with a lot of community organizations uh, either closing down or reducing their operation. I know early on during COVID, many inpatient treatment providers closed their doors and, uh, and kicked people out. And that had a very negative effect because you have uh, this population of people that really need help and they didn't have anywhere to go. And, uh, and I think that's why we're continuing to see, that's one of many reasons why we're seeing our overdose numbers continue to rise. And, and I agree, this is not something that's gonna end uh, in a couple of months. These are, these are long-term consequences that we're seeing. Um, stigma, for example, and I know Chelsea uh, and Dr. Roberson can talk about this, but we've spent a lot of work uh, trying to reduce stigma with regard to this population. And sadly, I think we're still in a situation where people uh, need, they, they have a lot to learn with regard to uh, trying to reduce that stigma and uh, trying to help this population. Uh, making sure, for example, that all these community organizations have sufficient supplies of naloxone uh, so they can distribute it to the communities and making sure uh, that fentanyl test strips uh, and other harm reduction practices are, uh, are out there in the community is more important now than ever. Um, our Away Out program is a program that we're all very proud of that allows people to access uh, treatment through the police, our sheriff's department, our coroner's department, our health department, um, many police departments throughout Lake County, and uh, all our treatment providers are huge partners in that. But early on in COVID, uh, because resources were so strained, we had to uh, reduce the entry point uh, police departments down to three. Um, and again, with inpatient treatment providers mostly being shut down, uh, that presented significant challenges, but I'm, I'm really proud of our opioid initiative and our partners like Live for Lally and a safe and, and Nicasa and some of these other treatment providers that were able to uh, continue to serve people uh, even when times were at their worst. Uh, on the positive side, uh, that all those departments are now back online, um, and the treatment providers are accepting folks inpatient and we're able to get more and more people into treatment now. So that's a positive, but uh, we still have a, a ways to go because those numbers are incredibly concerning. Um, there's, a, there's a new program that we're working towards, which would be include the creation of a physical uh, walk-in center or a drop-off center or a respite center 
uh, that will aid uh, this population, people struggling with addiction, uh, but also people struggling with homelessness and mental health issues. And, and there's often overlap in all of those. And I think uh, certainly as we can get that facility up and running, uh, that will increase participation in the Away Out program and so many of our other programs. So uh, I've probably already talked too long uh, and I will, uh, I'll end here and I'll uh, await questions and, and certainly look forward to hearing from our other great panelists. Sorry, I do that all the time. I was still muted. Um, thank you very much, State's Attorney Nierheim. Next, we're gonna hear from Lake County Sheriff John Eidelberg. Sheriff Eidelberg will provide information on their crisis outreach and response team, also known as COAST, uh, that initiative and efforts to expand and increase it. And he'll also address their work with other county agencies to focus on racial inequities in the justice system. Sheriff Eidelberg. Well, thank you, Chair Hart for that great introduction. And I also wanna thank the League of Women Voters for giving me the opportunity to talk about what we're doing here in the Lake County Sheriff's Department addressing mental illness and racial inequality in the criminal justice system. I would like to ask Ms. Mason, is it possible to remove her slide and so that I can share my slide as we move forward? Um, let's see. Okay. And then do you need, uh, do you already have access then for screen sharing, Sheriff? Yes, I oh, do. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, wait. Which? Yep. I can see it. Okay. Then. All right. Then. All right. We'll go to the next slide. Across the country, there have been cuts to social service and mental health services, creating a gap in treatment of our residents. Jails have, been, have become de facto mental health providers. That is wrong. We do not have the staff or resources or the expertise in mental illness. In Lake County, as given time, there are approximately 70% the inmates on some type of psychotropic medication. In 2017, there was an estimate for 46.6 million adults aged 18 or older in the United States with mental illness. This number represents 18.9% of all U.S. adults. Young adults aged 18 through 25 has the highest number of any mental illness, 25.8%. The Bureau of Justice Statistics reports that 64% of all jail population have a mental illness. 15% of, of male jail inmates and 31% of female jail inmates have serious mental illness. Many of those are listed on this slide. Co-current substance abuse is commonly among individuals with mental illness. BJS data indicates that more than half of jail inmates with mental illness use drugs or alcohol at the time of their crime. After our law enforcement officers encounter a mental health interaction with an opioid overdose, the coast deputies will make arrangement to meet with the individual approximately three days later after the initial event. During their meeting, the deputies will check the well-being of the person and determine if they have sought any treatment or service since the initial in, uh, event. The deputy will then offer the service of a social worker who has additional resources available and provide a warm handoff to the Lake County Health Department social worker. A social worker will conduct 
a brief assessment and if necessary, begin referring the person to the appropriate community service program. This type of program is new to Lake County, but has been quite successful in communities across the country. Communities with these type of program have provided, has proven to reduce law enforcement interaction with people having a mental illness. These reduce, I'm sorry, they reduce the likelihood of individuals being arrested or rearrested and provide an overall healthy and stable environment for all. And there is our, our data for COAST. As you can see, we have had 1,300 mental health interaction. 919 has been transported to an ER. Only 17 have been incarcerated, while 77 have been referred to Lake County Health Department and added service. Across the board, we have good contact rate and, contact and connecting with people. A big part of COAST is education. We can offer service, but the individual has to agree, and sometimes that's a challenge. But as we are interacting with these people, their family is right there asking us questions for when their relatives are ready to take the next step. We educate and give information, which the launch of the 211 that was a great tool to share. The deputies and health department social workers also on a as needed basis also drive people to treatment appointments to make sure they make it. Mike Nearheim, along with the Lake County Opiate Initiative are working to make the Lake County Crisis Center a reality. My office has submitted funding requesting to contribute to the crisis center initiative. This crisis center will be available, will be a valuable asset to our community as much needed to, to Lake County law enforcement. My office is the lead agency for the MacArthur Grant Foundation Safety Justice Challenge, whose goals is to reduce jail population, rethink the use of jail, and addressing issues of disparity and equity in a criminal justice system. The state's attorney, ninth judicial, adult probation, public defender are all critical partners in this work. To the end, we also have been providing technical assistance by the Gain Center and Burns Institute. We are part of a multiple, multiple site across the country that are part of the safety and justice challenge. I am one of the few that are led by the sheriff and it is something that I'm very proud of. In 2019, I have asked staff time to our group, our equity group, to develop a community focus plan and some highlights include, in partnership with our criminal justice partners, we met over a series of hours to define racial equality for law enforcement, I'm sorry, for Lake County for the criminal justice perspective. The definition is a community approach to provide equitable treatment and opportunity to criminal justice involvement personnel regardless of race. We led an all day racial and ethnic diversity workshop for some elected official, criminal justice partners and community members. Launch a public facing jail dashboard that shared jail data with the public going back to 2013 launching a criminal justice citizen council made of the criminal justice partners, community members, and social service providers. 
the goal is to bring all relevant partners to the table and to create a dialogue and to be a adversary counsel for my office. This year, even with the pand global pandemic, we doubled down on our equity work. Justice, justice rep representation increased and we have contact with experienced facility facilitators to increase community members in a series of focus group on criminal justice reform. Today, we have identified policy changes pilot to enact across the justice system to safety reduce jail population. And we have joined the Homeless Coalition to comprehensively address disparity related to criminal justice involved individual in a positive manner. We have been doing a lot of work and this is the beginning. We are, we are award more grants we will be able to take to the next step. I know people sometimes want changes to happen overnight, but changes take time. And over the last two years, we have been laying the foundation. We are getting close to where we can share more information and progress with the public. And we expect that to happen. We are very intentional about what we do and, and how we do our work. And I'm very proud of the people in the Lake County criminal justice system that are part of this work. This work is not easy. And these are discouraging. This is, I'm sorry, there are disagreements, but we find ways to move beyond for the greater good. Again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and Linda for this invitation. If any of you are interested in learning more about our work or joining our group, or our Criminal Justice Citizen Council, we are expanding our work. And if you have general questions, please email sheriff at lakecountyillinois.gov. Thank you, Sheriff Eidelberg. Thank you so much, Sheriff. We really appreciate all the work you are doing. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Coroner Cooper. And Coroner Cooper will talk about how COVID has impacted his office and his employees who are clearly on the front line of this pandemic. Corner Cooper. Great, thanks so much, Sandy. Um, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and uh, also to Dr. Mason and, and her groups, um, IVDRS and suitors. I mean, those folks come into our office on a very regular basis and uh, work super hard and go through all our data. And I know it's, uh, it's a long, tedious job, but obviously, as you can see, um, you know, it's, it's worthwhile because we're certainly being able to look at that data and look at the trends. Um, our office has been greatly affected by COVID. Um, you know, we have a pandemic plan that we had prior to this. And, um, you know, it's one of those plans that when you put it together, you never really think that we're going to have to actually use it. And uh, in fact, we did. Um, the first thing that we did um, is uh, purchase a, uh, a refrigerated trailer. Uh, we knew that we would um, have to put folks inside that trailer to uh, keep our folks safe. Um, the interesting thing about the COVID virus is it does stay viable for uh, 72 hours, uh, even after someone is deceased. So obviously that's a very big risk to, um, to my folks um, and the people that are, are working with the deceased, including police, fire, funeral directors, hospital workers, so um, when our pandemic plan, we actually got it out to all the first responders, also to the hospital agencies, uh, long-term care facilities and funeral directors. And uh, we worked very hard to make sure that all those folks had everything they need, whether it be PPE or body bags or storage facilities. Um, a number of our hospitals were worried about storage capacity. Um, one of our local hospitals um, on a number of occasions um, we picked up some folks over there that we could store at our office for them because they don't have morgues that are um, generally large enough to store that kind of, um, you know, events. So um, it's certainly something that we've been really, really busy with. Um, the other thing that people don't really think about is that, you know, once uh, these folks go through our office or even coming out of a long-term care facility or at a hospital, um, they need to go to funeral homes and the funeral homes need to be able to process the bodies and 
um, you know, either, either have cremations or do what they're going to need to do. So we needed to make sure that those people were also protected by giving them PPE. Um, and so, you know, we did. So it was really just a, a lot of work. And um, our numbers um, definitely have gone up. We've been very busy. Um, we've had about 450 uh, COVID deaths in our county, which is uh, substantially less than what we were anticipating. Originally, we were anticipating over 4,000 is what they predicted. Um, so certainly we've done better than that, but obviously even one COVID death is a death too many. So um, it's, uh, while it's better, it's certainly not what we, uh, what we like. 68% um, of our COVID deaths are from long-term care facilities. Um, and so those are people that are obviously um, have comorbidities and um, there's you know issues with that. But I think when all is said and done, um, something that we're gonna do um, is sit down with the long-term care facilities and really try and figure out exactly what happened, whether it be um, you know things how they were sterilized at their facility or how they were meeting you know or, or uh, working with the people there. Um, obviously, we don't want viruses to spread through these facilities, so we need to figure out why it ran rampant. Um, in those places. So that's something that we will sit down and do. Um, as far as our uh, overdose numbers, um, we have noticed an increase in overdoses. Um, our overdoses for the year were at 73 confirmed overdoses. Uh, 63 of those are opioid related. Um, when we compare the numbers for the same time period for 2019, we were at 64 and 54 were opioid. So it looks like, yes, we have obviously an increase, but the bigger picture with that is that we still have 20 cases pending. So if those cases do turn out to be um, you know, drug related, which we do believe that they are, we could be at 93 confirmed, um, which obviously for all of last year, we were at 94 um, for the whole entire year. So um, certainly we run the risk of being a, a lot higher than we would like. Um, the uh, other issue is when, you know, we talked about fentanyl and I know um, Mike Nerham had spoken about it and, you know, that we are seeing an increase in that. And yes, we are. I mean, last year's numbers, 90% of those involved fentanyl. So um, it's certainly something we're seeing more and more. And now it's becoming very, very regular. Um, we're also seeing a lot of different kinds of fentanyl. So fentanyl, uh, which is a, um, a man-made or a laboratory-made um, narcotic, uh, or opioid, um, the problem with it is that it can be changed. So when they change it in the lab, it makes, uh, it makes for different uh, analogs. And so we're seeing a lot of different types. The other issue with that too is that sometimes we see a new type and we have to make sure that the facility that we're using for testing keeps up with all the different analogs. So that's something too that we make sure that our uh, testing facility is doing that. So um, as far as suicides, um, our suicides, we definitely noticed, have been going up as well. Um, we had uh, 50, so far we're at 55 suicides this year compared to the same time period last year, we were at 45. Um, 65 is where we were all year last year. Uh, and, you know, the reality is we're going into a much tougher time the next three months. And I know a lot of people say, yeah, it's the holidays, but we really don't see a big increase with suicides in the holidays. The bigger thing that I think is going to be an issue is that for the beginning of COVID, all the banks and loan agencies and things like that were really great with people and said, oh, you don't have to pay for three months. Well, you know, the next couple of months, we're going to see banks and, and loan agencies coming out and saying, you know, they want their money. And I think that that's going to be a, a big issue for a lot of people. So um, we're certainly not happy about that. But I do think that we're going to see a, a further increase later on in the year. And I also think that's why we're seeing, you know, overdose increases too. Uh, in addition to, um, you know, the fact that all these people were isolated at the very beginning, there were no groups, um, there was no place that people had an outlet to do what they normally do to get through these times. Um, it's, uh, I think it's been very challenging for a number of people and especially when mental health is involved, it's, uh, it's really been hard. Our homicides, um, we are at 24 for the year uh, compared to 33 of last year. Um, but I will say alarmingly um, that the last three weeks we've had 10 homicides. Um, one was at one o'clock this morning and I and my deputy were actually out all night. So it's something that we're seeing, like I said, in the last 
three weeks, um, it's been really unbelievable what we're seeing in our county. Now, I think a lot of that is that, you know, at the very beginning, our numbers were down because people really were, were trying to stay inside and nobody was going out and everything was closed and people were quarantined. And we're seeing people a lot now a lot more out and about and things are happening. And I think people are, um, I think people are really sort of striking out because, um, you know, they've been stuck inside for so long and, and things have been really hard. And I think that a lot of stuff is going on. A lot of this is probably drug related. Uh, and, um, and, you know, some of it um, is just, um, uh, you know, people just, just trying to uh, voice out and do things that they normally wouldn't do because they've been stuck inside so long. So it's really a, a big challenge for us in our office. Um, to give you an idea of where we're at globally with all of our numbers, um, we're up uh, approximately 700 deaths for the year. Um, that's a very big increase for us. Um, that gives each of my deputies over, uh, over 80 cases. And, um, and it's been uh, really, really a substantial, substantial increase. So um, we also do um, COVID also uh, with our plan, we had to have an offsite morgue just in case we did have the numbers that, um, that we thought we may have. And so we do at the Waukegan airport, we do have a hangar there with four refrigerated trailers in case we need them. Um, right now we're keep every, keeping everything standing by because um, we're worried about you know, what happens towards the end of the year when there uh, is the possibility of a surge. That's what we're hearing. And so that's why we're keeping everything the way it is, just so we're prepared. Um, the last thing we want to do is tear everything down and then realize at the end of the year that we're in a lot of trouble. So, you know, we want to do what's best for the families. We certainly want to make sure that we treat, you know, the decedents with uh, the utmost care. And, and the last thing we want is for them to be piling up somewhere. So we want to make sure we have facilities that's, uh, that's good for them. So that's really where we're at. I, I wish I had better news. Unfortunately, it always seems like my office just doesn't really have the greatest news because um, unfortunately the things that we track is not uh, something that, that people really like to hear about. But it's, um, you know, we like I said, I think it's important that we see where we're going and, and try to work with the different groups to try and figure out how we can curb these numbers and, and see what we can come up with. And I know that uh, certainly the sheriff and, and our state's attorney has been uh, very cognizant of that. And uh, we all talk uh, a fair amount about where our numbers are and what's going on in, in the county. So, um, you know, I think everybody just really tries to work together and, uh, and do what we can to help. So thank you again for this opportunity. And certainly if anybody has questions, uh, feel free. Thank you. Darn it, I did it again. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next, we will hear from Sandra Gomez uh, from the Lake County Health Department. Ms. Gomez will bring information about trauma and COVID-19, and she'll also provide information on how Lake County Health Department is providing mental health services during this pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. Thank you so much. Um, um, good afternoon, everyone. Trauma and COVID-19, how the health department is providing mental health services during the pandemic. And I think this topic is important for the families to know uh, what is trauma? Why is it important for, uh, for all of us to know about this? So trauma is an event, series of events or set, or set of circumstances that is experienced by individual as a physically or emotionally harmful or life threatening and that has lasting adverse effects for the individuals functioning in mental, physical, social, emotional, or physical well-being. So many types of trauma, but I'm not going to go in details of each of them. I'm just going to mention what is some type of trauma that we have been seeing increase during the pandemic. It's domestic violence, unexpected breakup of divorce, loss in job or house, community violence, medical trauma due to negative experience of COVID-19 hospitalization, and death of a loved one. It's important to keep in mind that emotional trauma is one of the most unrecognized, undiagnosed, and unreported form of trauma. So, but I would like to go more in details about this, uh, what is trauma and, and what is important for us to recognize in our families, with our friends. So trauma is how a person emotionally or physically responds to something. 
two people can experience the same event and have very different reactions. And I'm going to give an example. Some people think uh, going in a roller coaster ride. Some people think it's so fun and other people think that it's terrifying. Totally different experience. Trauma can be something that happens to you or someone you care about or something that you witness in person or even in TV. So uh, regarding just be witness on TV, an example can be the collapse of the Twin Towers in New York on September 11. Not everyone who experienced one of these events will experience trauma. Sometimes people experience things that others will think will tell them that is no big of a deal. But it has a significant impact that lasts a long time of that person's ability to do things that they normally do. This could be considered a trauma for that person. So I think this is a, or what we are experiencing in the community with the COVID-19 is a good time to increase our knowledge about trauma. So how the health department is providing mental health services during the pandemic? Telehealth. The health departments continue to provide a combination of both. Telehealth and in-person visit for most of the program. From the beginning of the pandemic, the health department rapidly transitioned to provide telehealth services. And this has been important for those who doesn't want to go to a facility to reduce the risk for COVID, but also for those who doesn't have transportation services. This is some of the services, and we have a lot of services, but some are mental health and substance use services for adults, also child and adolescent behavioral services, and we provide counseling, psychiatry services, substance abuse, and more. The crisis care program, it's a program 24-7 available for all Lake County residents. We provide services in English and Spanish. Uh, if someone have any questions, uh, have a crisis, they don't know where to go, they can call and we will provide services. Also, we have uh, walking services in this program. So working together, the health department continue to work with the community agencies to reduce the impact of trauma reaction for COVID-19, that reaction that COVID-19 might have on the population. During this pandemic, we can, we has been seeing an increase of awareness of mental health needs, and this is fantastic. So this is the great time to work together as a community to reduce the stigma of mental health, educating the families, identify the needs and provide more resources in the community. To accomplish it, the work is start here with each of us. Keeping in mind that everyone, all of us have mental health and knowing how to keep ourselves and our families healthy. So this is the time to talk and protect our mental health. So in the end, if you have any questions about what we are doing in Lake County Health Department, feel free to submit your question. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Thomas. I appreciate it. And I just want to put a plug in for the work that the League of Women Voters Lake County has done. Uh, we did a program together a few years ago um, about the importance of uh, talking about mental health. So again, Lake County, uh, League of Women Voters Lake County has been a real leader on this. So thank you very much. Um, next, we'll hear from Dr. Mary Roberson uh, of the Northern Illinois Recovery Organization. Uh, Dr. Roberson, my friend, will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on individuals and families in the community, recovering from the effects of substance use disorder, criminal justice involvement, homelessness, and mental health issues. Dr. Roberson. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hart. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to the Lake County uh, League of Women Voters. Thank you for having me here. So um, with the recovery community, uh, NERCO is the first and only one here in Lake County, and we're very proud of that. You know, myself being a person in long-term recovery, uh, having a, a thumbs on the community. Uh, since the COVID-19, we all know it's been talked about uh, from state's attorney and uh, the um, coroner, 
uh, the isolation that people in recovery have experienced as a result of COVID-19. Uh, we know that the treatment providers uh, had to withdraw some of the services to protect the, the community, as well as the mutual support um, systems like uh, AA and NA and all the other um, uh, anonymous programs that provide that in-person services to recovery communities. We are pretty fortunate though, you know, we're six months in into COVID or, and uh, some of the meetings are opening back up. We had to shift some things around with NERCO. We started out with in-person, uh, all recovery support meetings, uh, having multiple pathways. And then we uh, got impacted by COVID and we had to shift over to virtual, uh, virtual meetings. Now, initially that was very difficult for some of the individuals because some people didn't have uh, technology to navigate those systems. We know that some of the people who are impacted by substance use disorder and mental health and homelessness and criminal justice and all of those social ills don't have a lot of the things that a bunch of us on this particular uh, call have. So we had to make those particular adjustments to help them to navigate that. Some people had uh, smartphones, some people had government phones and wasn't able to really kind of zoom into the, the, the meeting, the virtual meeting platforms. But we've been pretty fortunate over the last couple months that uh, people been had the ability to do that. One of the things that NERCO has been doing is having our advisors to reach out you know, to individuals in the recovery community to see how we could assist with those things. Now, I, I am aware that there's some other peer recovery services, there's some other recovery support services that's in our communities, but when we have boots on the ground that's able to, uh, to reach out to individuals, I think that that has been helping tremendously. Another thing with the COVID impact, one of the things that we have been hearing, you know, from the recovery community is they do have a lot of isolation and depression and anxiety that's going on and not being able to, you know, meet personally or in person with their therapist or their counselor. You know, a lot of the things that we hear is that it doesn't feel the same to do the, the, the virtual counseling or the telehealth counseling that we had to improvise with. So we have been also uh, doing a lot of telephone counseling, calling people on the phone. In the recovery community, they talk a lot about pick up the phone and call someone. Where if a person doesn't have the minutes on their phone, they've been impacted financially by COVID-19, it's very difficult to do those things. So we have been reaching out to make sure that we stay in touch with them. Well, over the last couple months, we've seen a 50% increase in the number of people that's tapping into our virtual support meetings. And of that 50% over the last month or so, that has gone down 25% because now the uh, recovery support meetings are open up. And Waukegan, at the Waukegan Alano Club, where we've had held some of our Lake County Opiate Initiative meetings, they have been opening back up but it's very, very uh, monitored. You know, some of the meetings, there's only a, uh, a certain number of individuals that could go into the meetings. You have to be matched, you, it's spread out. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the hugs, no drug kind of thing that came about many, many years ago. People in the recovery community, they really, really believe in those hugs. So with the COVID-19 and the social distancing and no touching, even when they go into the meetings at the Alano Club or the various churches, it's not the hugs anymore. It's the arm bump, it's the fist bump, it's all of those things that COVID-19 has really brought about in the recovery community. And that's fine and dandy to protect ourselves, but you have to think about individuals that's been impacted a lot about with mental health and substance use disorder. I know the opiate epidemic has been a big thing over the last few years, but there's a lot of individuals that's been impacted and recovering from the long ago cocaine epidemic that's in our recovery communities. So it's important that we as a recovery community organization here in Lake County take those things into account. You know, the other thing that the COVID-19 
has really impacted on our recovery communities, particularly the homeless population, is they don't have access to PADS, which is one of the number one organizations that help out. Uh, our PADS partners, they had to relocate a lot of the homeless individuals into hotels. And what that did is increase the use of alcohol, increase the use of substances and things of that sort. And now you have a rise in the active use of the substances, but you don't have the support services that's available. Again, telehealth, virtual services, that's fine for you and I, because we might have the cognitive ability to navigate through that. But when you've been chronic, chronically homeless, involved in the criminal justice system, have a substance use disorder, sometimes those things are not easily navigated. I'm very proud to say that the advisors and the board of NERCO have been working really, really hard to make sure that we have those recovery support services that's available to them. The other thing that I would like to say as far as the criminal justice, um, you, we have been involved uh, with the Veterans Treatment Court and the other problem solving courts and having again, that hands-on experience with, with, with talking to the vets and talking to the individuals in drug court, talking with the individuals in, in mental health court, it's been very, very helpful. And then the other part of it, and I'm gonna close with this, is having someone that looks like an individual that's in recovery. I don't mean someone that's walking the street, I mean someone that's having you know, a vision, a hope. And I implore everybody on this, this line, if you know of an individual or family member that's been impacted by substance use disorder or mental health, and they are you know, seeking recovery support services, do a warm handoff. We talked about this for many, many years about doing a warm handoff you know, with individuals. Lake County is pretty fortunate that we have a multitude of different providers and the, the state's attorney and all the, the other entities, but it's also important to know that when people go back into their home environment, go back into their communities, they need those recovery support services. It's fine to be in treatment, it's fine to be in drug court, it's fine to be you know, involved with a probation officer, but when they go back to the community, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's good to have somebody there that can help them to navigate through those recovery support services. And I just wanna say that we are grateful to be able to provide that. So thank you so much, League of Women Voters. Thank you, Chairman Hart, for this opportunity. And if you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, moving on, last but not least, uh, Chelsea La Liberte Barnes. She is the co-founder of Live for Lollies and Advocacy Strategist, and she also serves as the board's co-chair. Uh, Chelsea will explain what Live for Lolly does to minimize the health, legal, and social harms associated with substance use disorder and how COVID-19 has impacted their work. Chelsea? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, League of Women Voters. Um, it's great to be here and, um, and to be among colleagues and friends who all agree that these conversations are really, really important to have. Uh, so first and foremost, I am a person in long-term recovery from mental health and substance use and trauma. Um, I'm also a clinical social worker. I do work in private practice. So I've been working on the ground, helping families and patients who struggle with co-occurring issues of all kinds for the last 10 years. Um, I'm also really fortunate to, to know and work well with a lot of the people who have already presented. Um, and I grew up in Buffalo Grove, um, and you know, like like you you kind of hear these stories of who is dying from an overdose, like who is impacted by this crisis. Um, for a very long time, the the message was that it was only like young white suburban middle class kids who were really becoming impacted by this, and that's who you were seeing die. Um, my family got impacted during that time too, when my brother Alex died from an overdose in our home in Buffalo Grove, and we were. I think one of the only families who had come out with our story and just said, listen, we're gonna talk about this because guess what? Stigma is the number one reason why people don't get help. It's the number one reason why people don't have resources. It's the number one reason why people stay sick 
and why societies have not evolved beyond our judgments of people who stay sick. So I just want to say that because you know, th these stigmas are created for vast reasons. They're created in our policy structures. We're created in our awareness campaigns. Um, um, say no to drugs is a great example. You know, Nancy Reagan was super well-intentioned with her, with her plight of, of pleading with kids not to use drugs. But what that did was, was it told people, it, it sent the message that um, drugs are bad and people are bad. And so they deserve punishment. So those types of things have reinforced our society's response to drug use. And so I just want to say loud and clear, we are not going to have a drug, uh, a um, abstinence society. It's just not going to happen. People want to avoid pain and seek pleasure. That's what we do. That's what humans do all day long. That's what your brain is trying to do all day long. So to, to, to believe that we can just have people stop using, I just wanna say right now that that is not a realistic response. So if that's not gonna be the response, what do we have to do? Well, we have to look to data to try and figure out how to address this. And so that's why, as Dr. Robeson said, we need to keep people in treatment. We need to make sure that people have recovery support services, which includes a lot of things. It's not just going to a meeting. That's not what recovery means. Recovery is an individualized process for every single person. Connecting with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, um, having a job, having a house, having um, access to healthcare, not being incarcerated for your mental health condition as Sheriff Eiderberg so brilliantly said at the beginning, this is nonsensical, right? So if we don't invest in those things, we're just gonna keep cycling out what we've always been doing. And I also forgot to mention prevention, which you know we, we definitely need to be teaching young people you know, safer coping strategies, we know that, and building families and communities that have the, these types of constructs set up. Um, but at the end of the day, Live for Lolly has chosen to take very much the approach of how do we prevent the ultimate thing, which is death. How do we keep people alive? How do we love them? How do we come at them from a compassion-based place to really empower people to have the tools to, um, to eventually recover? So the approach that we take um, is we, we definitely engage in peer support. We have a whole peer support program for that. And we've, like Mary said, we've had to change up everything to become a 100% virtually based program. We provide extensive, extensive education for professionals, for lay people, for families, for patients. What is substance use? How does it tie into mental health? What is the syndemic that we're in with overdose deaths and um, HIV and Hep C transmissions and other deaths of despair? Um, we provide um, advocacy services, which you know a lot of that is policy work, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I want to focus really uh, for a couple minutes on harm reduction. So one thing that we don't talk about a lot is um, needle exchange services and, frankly, community-based outreach programs. If we know, if there is something that we know about substance people who use substances, it's that they're going to use whether or not you tell them not to. And so, with that said, hundred other countries across the world have done something that America has not yet, which is rally around public health strategies to really be, um, to keep people safe. And in countries that have needle exchange services, which really is basically a way for people who are engaging in substance use to be able to use safer, to reduce infectious diseases, to reduce um, overdose deaths, to reduce crime, to reduce addiction. And what we see in other countries that have these programs set up fully funded by their government and are used as frontline strategies in dealing with people who use drugs is, like I just said, low rates of HIV and Hep C, very low rates of death. I think Switzerland had like 17 deaths last year to overdose and we're about to go over 100,000 this year highest every year ever on record. I mean, think about that. So until we decide that we are going to throw data as the driver of our decision-making of program development and strategic response, we are still going to see these deaths. Until we, we realize that, that um, 
this 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 syndemic this drug use is is very vast we can't control what the international drug crime organizations do we can't control what the mexican drug cartels and the kind of distributors in our own communities that are making pills in their basement and mixing it with all sorts of stuff do what we can control is the way we design our policies and our systems and our programs and the way we respond to people in our lives who use the response of i'm going to leave you i hate you i don't like people who use drugs that does not work very well in a society where where lots of people frankly, need substances to survive the day. I don't think I'd be a loving person in my, in my home if I didn't have coffee every morning. I think I would just be really angry and frustrated and needed a boost. I mean, if, if you can raise your hand and say, that's me too. Okay, so then you know what I'm talking about. But there's really not a big difference chemically in the brain that we see between that and using heroin or cocaine. I mean, it's a very similar process. So we have to realize what we're talking about here. So. Um, making sure that communities can have access to naloxone, that communities can have access to treatment, not just for 30 days, for the lifetime, okay? And making sure that it's evidence-based treatment. So therapy combined with social supports and medications. We have great medications for opioid use and alcohol use disorders. You may have heard of them, methadone, buprenorphine, Vivitrol, these medications not only do they help people live and survive having an addiction, but they also prevent death. So I, I think that um, investing in that and also recognizing that what we're in right now, this war on drugs is inherently racist, socioeconomic factors are, con are contributors to it. And until we actually move to change the way people are handled who have drug use issues or mental health in this country by not incarcerating them and instead treating them, we are going to continue to see this persist. So we don't have time to wait. We have to start working on these things if we haven't yet or accepting that we need to do them. So, um, you know, uh, if people need to access peer support, naloxone, which is the drug that reverses overdose, clean supplies, just a friendly person to talk to who's not going to judge you on the other end of the line. Our staff also helps with treatment navigation and care coordination. Um, you know, please reach out. And of course, if you have ideas or you want to express an issue that is happening in your own community that we can try and elevate on a policy level, do not hesitate to reach out to me because I know how powerful policy can be in creating change. And I know you all do too here on the panel. So anyways, I'm gonna stop there. I'm always available to talk to anybody who needs help or advice. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Really appreciate it and appreciate the time of all the panelists. We do have, I know we're like um, right at three, but there's some super quick questions I wanted to get to if you don't mind. Um, and some of you may have seen this. So one of the questions was, um, uh, will you be able to publish data for 2020 anytime soon? It looks like it's not available. It won't be available in full until March or April of 2021. But do we have enough? Um, we know we have 2018. And if we have 2019 data available now, can we take a look and seeing if there's any trends or comparisons that could be done? And that's a question for Dr. Mason. Hey, thanks for that question. And that's the, the constant struggle is uh, how um, recent can our data be? So we will have 2019 data probably in October. Um, it goes through a process of vetting and certification so we know it's absolutely accurate. So that data will come out in October and we'll be doing releases of that. The 2020 data um, is, uh, under collection now so um, it's going to take a while um, and as i mentioned earlier that and i think Dr. cooper did too there have been a lot of delays with the number of deaths and all the testing requirements okay thank you um and then this is a question for coroner cooper do you or other county officials have the raw data for the months of covid enough so that you could spot trends 
Well, as far as where the deaths are, yes. I mean, we're definitely working with the health department and they're tracking that as well. Um, all of our deaths, when we're notified, we actually send that information to the health department um, for them to do tracking and contact tracing and things like that. So um, we'll put it together as well because our data is going to be a little bit different than theirs um, because their our deaths are considered anybody that dies in our county, whereas they look at also where people live. So if it's somebody that comes into our county and passes away, that would actually be a COVID death for a different county. So, um, so our numbers are going to be a little bit different than the health department, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we will certainly look at that. Our main focus is going to be to look at um, where those people are from, what facilities those people were, uh, were in, and, um, or if they were home deaths, and then um, if they had comorbidities. So we'll certainly be looking at all that information. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is for Dr. Mason. Do we know how many of the suicides are veteran um, or military related? Um, that is one of the variables that we do collect. In the past, we haven't thought it to be reliable enough because it's based on a uh, family member report. However, new studies have come out to show in fact it is reliable, so we will be looking at that in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, and then our last question is uh, for the League of Women Voters. Where can someone go to find this presentation. I think you had put out that all the slides will be sent to the people who participated, but if somebody wanted to watch this, um, how could they do that if they couldn't make it today? Hi, um, I, I think that might be for me. Um, we will be posting that. We have to compress it and the um, Northwestern will be compressing the, the recording and we will put that on, they will have that on their website and the league will be posting it also. There may be an opportunity that we can send the link out uh, when we send the slide information, when Northwestern sends their slide information out to. Uh, maybe Marianne can um, help us with that a little bit, but we will, we will be sure to, to get that information out to folks. We have a list of all the people that have attended and we will send links. All right, perfect. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much to the panelists for spending time today on this, I think, a lovely Sunday afternoon. I haven't been out in a little while. Um, I also just want to say um, that I'm thrilled uh, again about um, the work as we're moving towards this crisis center. So uh, it's something that I've probably bored people talking about a crisis center for easily the last five years. And uh, I'm very excited that I think it is coming to fruition. It's something um, State's Attorney Nearheim and I have been working on together and uh, we're getting closer and closer, I think. So anyway, uh, thank you so much. And I am going to turn it back to um, Kathleen for okay. close. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sandy. And, and thank you to all our participants, for everyone showing up today. Um, and uh, there's just so, there's so much to unpack here. Um, the league will be thinking about this. We will be reaching out um, and uh, talking to each of our panelists about how we can move these ideas forward. At this point, uh, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Lake County, I would like to thank Marianne Mason and her incredible team at Northwestern, very talented, compassionate people. Chairwoman Hart, State's Attorney Nearheim, Sheriff Eidelberg, Dr. Cooper, Sandy Gomez, Dr. Robertson, uh, and Chelsea um, Lalabretta Barnes, I hope I have that right, and of course Tania Andrews has helped us uh, bring this all together. It's been a very informative uh, community discussion. I would also like to thank the League's behind the scene champion for this event, Linda Bartmas. Thank you so much, Linda. And finally, I would like to thank all of our participants. I want to thank you for taking the time to attend this forum. Forum. Together, our actions will, in the words of the late John Lewis, help us create a beloved community. With that, I wish you all a very good and very safe afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.